Bednar was recognized late this summer as the Pirates nominee for the Roberto Clemente Award, befitting the extensive and intensive time that he spent in his community. But I got to tell you, I saw this this young man immersed in his community in a special way yesterday. Good morning to you. Good Monday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports, and this is Daily Shot of Pirates. It comes your way bright and early every weekday. If you're into football and or hockey, I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Penguins. But if you're into football... And you're a Pirates fan. Chances are excellent you're also a Steelers fan. And I I didn't see this coming, okay? Before the game, the Steelers do a, a towel waving right after the players are introduced. Everybody's just on the field. Everybody's already stoked and fired up and whatever. And the Steelers will bring a special guest out, usually a former Steeler, to lead the big towel waving before kickoff. And they introduced David Bednar. They even mentioned Renegade. And I'm not going to lie here. I know what Bednar means to the Pirates fan base. But there's always a part of me that's interested in the the cross-pollination between our three teams. However it is that that works out. When the Penguins were winning Stanley Cups a handful of years ago, uh, it was amazing for me to see you know Garrett Cole and Joe Musgrove come over and well they kind of made fools of themselves but they were there okay uh, to see Ben Roethlisberger Mike Tomlin Ryan Shazier uh, guys like that come over and the same would be true in the reverse meaning they were coming to Pirates games whenever the Pirates were in the playoffs from 2013 to 15 but this this was a little bit different I really wanted to see what kind of reception he'd get, but I also wanted to see how he'd react to whatever it was that he got. People, this went so much better from those two standpoints than anyone could have expected. Because he goes out there and he's waving this towel, and you could tell his heart was in it. Gigantic smile on his face, and he's jumping up and down at one point in the direction of the players, and the crowd just kept getting more and more into it. And then, and you don't see this part on whatever it was that they might or might not have shown you on TV, but when Bednar was done, he was high-fiving everyone in sight, including just hugging family and friends and everything else. He was just so fired up that he was able to have this moment. And even that wasn't it. Again, I don't know what they showed on the broadcast. So I'm just going to share what I saw myself. But when the team played actual Renegade, the stick song, which for those of you who aren't football people, I'll elaborate that this is something that the Steelers have done at Akersher Stadium slash Heinz Field for a long time. Whenever they feel there's a pivotal moment in the game that requires defense. Well, it's early in the fourth quarter. The Steelers are trailing. It's the arch rival Ravens in the building. And the scoreboard goes dark. And everybody who's in there knows what that means because they're about to do Renegade. And you hear the oh mama and everything else. The place is just going ballistic, right? And Styx breaks into the main verse and everything. And... The crowd is just loving it and going crazy. And then the stadium camera, this is not television, the stadium camera that puts images on the scoreboard cuts to Bednar in his suite. Now he's upstairs. He's in a suite, but he's standing there in front of it, waving this towel like crazy, trying to get people going. When the crowd saw this, Whatever bedlam had already been occurring went to some other insane level. And I got to tell you, that was just really, really cool. It was really cool that there was a a pirate, especially if you're in Pittsburgh, you're going to know what I'm talking about here. The pirates aren't cool. Okay. Andrew McCutcheon is cool. 
the pirates are not. Roberto Clemente is cool. The pirates are not. The list of things that are related to the pirates that are cool is very, very short. A.J. Burnett happened to be at the game. A.J. is cool. The pirates are not. This was amazing to see a pirate, a hometown lad, being embraced the way he was in the football stadium by 67,000 people. Nearly half of them don't even live anywhere near here, as I've been over with Steelers fans over the years. Their season ticket base is a lot different than what shows up over at PNC Park. And I have absolutely nothing of consequence to add to this. I don't have a point that I'm trying to make. I just thought this was cool and I wanted to share it with somebody. And you just happened to be the one to press play when we come back, J1Q. This portion of Daily Shot of Pirates is brought to you by our friends at North Shore Tavern. That's directly across Federal Street from PNC Park. It's home of steak on a stone and eating experience underscoring the word experience the steak is brought to you partially cooked on an 800 degree stone and you do the rest it's a ton of fun it's a great meal and it's a baseball atmosphere like no other in pittsburgh north shore tavern right across federal street from pnc park your front door your car your bike your computer your gun. Safety is a habit. Every day you lock and secure your home and everything you want to keep safe. Gun safety and responsible storage are no different and the best way to help prevent accidents, misuse, and theft. If you have a firearm, own it, respect it, and secure it. Visit projectchildsafe.org. Brought to you by the National Shooting Sports Foundation and the Bureau of Justice Assistance. Today's J1Q comes from Joe, who says, DK, I believe that there's a good analogy to O'Neill Cruz's situation with what happened recently with Fernando Tatis and the Padres. Although Tatis was out due to a PED suspension, not an injury, when he returned, he was moved off shortstop and put into the outfield because of the acquisition of Xander Bogarts. Tatis seems to be thriving in the outfield, even though, like Cruz, he expressed the desire to stay at short. Sounds like the most logical solution, of course. This also begs the question, what about Henry Davis? But that is a question for another day. Actually, Joe, I'm going to respectfully disagree about the similarities between Cruz and Tatis. Uh, yeah, you you got the ones accurate about wanting to stay there and how they had a gap in their careers, but a couple of things are different. One is that Cruz is coming back from an injury, and you don't know if he can play short, and that's different than when Tatis came back. I think what you wanted to see, if you were the Padres from Tatis more than anything, was stability and a focus on the bat, but the Padres had someone else, as you also pointed out. The Pirates don't. They don't. And we can pretend that Leo Verpaguero doesn't commit all the errors that he does, but he does. He's not consistent at short. He's never been consistent at short. And once you're in the majors and playing on all the manicured fields, including PNC Park, where the grass and the condition of the surface is just immaculate. You can throw out the most common uh, excuse or explanation that's given for a minor leaguer struggling with errors, and that's that, well, you know, the fields aren't great and the ball will hit a pebble and go up into somebody's throat or whatever. That's not the case in the bigs. And Peguero really hasn't been all that good. He'll do something occasionally that'll make you go, wow, but it's not anything that's saying to you, wow, this guy's got to be your everyday shortstop. It's just not. We can pretend similarly that Alika Williams can hit because he did it for about a month this year. 
two weeks in Indianapolis, two weeks in Pittsburgh. Remember? But that's not going to do it either. Alika can really field. I mean, he is smooth. But he went, what was it, the final six weeks or so of the season? Just couldn't do anything offensively. It was really excruciating to watch at one point because he was just leaving like 100 people on base every game. You need Cruz to be your shortstop in addition to wanting him to be that, in addition to his wanting to be that. I also feel like you owe it to him. He didn't do anything wrong in injuring his ankle. And if he continues to work as he has in his rehab, following the team's guidelines, following their prescriptions, and yes, following their orders to cool it when he tries to get too hot with this, and he were to show up in Bradenton, just, you know, ready to go. Why put a ceiling over his head? Why not see what he can do at that position? Why not see what he can still bring while also remaining open to the idea that he could move to somewhere else? You know what's funny about this particular Discussion, and I raise it myself, so I'm as guilty as anybody else would be on this regard. But O'Neill's best chance of getting hurt in baseball is what? Meaning from his leg standpoint or his ankle. Right, exactly the way he did it. It's base running. You go back over the major injuries that you've ever seen in baseball, the, the lower body stuff, the leg stuff, the knees, the ankles. Where have you seen those players getting hurt? It's not playing shortstop. It's always, always, always running the bases or something going wrong within running the bases the way it happened, unfortunately, to Cruz. So more to think about there. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Pirates. We'll do another one of these tomorrow. 